So thank you once more and lovely to be here at the BSV. It's always a joy for me to come and uh, see many familiar faces again, some I haven't seen for a while. Every, every month it's a, a different, almost a different group. I mean, you're all part of the BSV and <laughs> some come this month and some come a few months later. <laughs> Still, when we do meet uh, on some deep level, we have the great capacity to connect in the Dhamma and also become aware of some of our confusion and delusions. Even me sitting here and talking about it, I always go home reflecting on things I have said and things that have come up for me during this time. And uh, I realize, you know, there is never an end to our practice, and never an end to the, the enriching of our hearts. Usually at this time, and as you notice, there's not a camera in front, which I'm feeling rather grateful for today. <laughs> I always wonder what goes up on that screen and <laughs> what the world sees, you know. I wanted to start uh, today's talk with an analogy. It's an a Zen, a Zen analogy. And as to do, today's talk is going to be to reflect on what we have experienced this year in the light of the, 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 the um, parami of generosity and gratefulness, gratitude. And there is a saying that even um, an empty bowl is something we should be grateful for. When we see an empty bowl, you know, we often think, well, we should put something in it, especially at, at dana time. <laughs> and we don't particularly think about the empty bowl in a sense of a token of gratitude. <laughs> we, we rather have this idea, especially at this time of the year, you know, let's fill it up. So everyone's pantries are full and the Christmas cakes and the puddings are being baked and the whatever throughout households in, in the world. But not only for monks, but for all of us, when we recognize this vessel, this bowl we carry with us every day, the real meaning of it the real enrichment of it is when it's emptied out. When every last little bit of self, self-interest, self-needs, objects are no longer there, just even if it's for a split second. And you know, without this empty bowl, we don't get which is what the Dharma is pointing us to. So we have, each one of us all have our own ring, have our own resonance. And it's very perceptible to anyone who has deeply experienced emptiness when others also do their ring is very clear. Their deep vibration is very beautiful. So, in saying this, I'd like for the next few moments, we have a little meditation together. So if you'd like to um, straighten your backs, be aware of your feet on the, the ground or on your cushion. Place your hands in a comfortable way. 
and just be aware of your head, and your shoulders, your back. And as we just allow ourselves to sink into our bodies and breathe very naturally, I want us to, for a few moments, just have a sense of being grateful for the opportunity to be here, be present, be in your empty vessel as it is <coughs> the feelings that may be comfortable or uncomfortable the thoughts that are scrambling for your attention as you so slowly settle in to your meditation. The breathing becomes a little more natural as your body relaxes. I want you to bring to mind a situation of fulfillment, something that was deeply satisfying, deeply rewarding for you in this past year, where your heart is filled for the gratitude. Firstly, to yourself for bringing this situation to fruition. For you making the effort the time gift of yourself to share what it was that you could give to yourself and others in this situation. And as you feel gratitude, your, far, your heart feels very open and content. Reflect on how this situation benefited others. Maybe people in your workplace, your colleagues, or in your family. Maybe it was just a small deed, but it had a repercussion. And it opened opportunities for others to also have enjoyment and contentment and fulfillment. So we bring this memory fully into mind. We may also see how it is working to benefit our future. <coughs> For all of this, we have deep gratitude. 
It arises spontaneously. We don't have to make an effort. True gratitude comes from not trying. But when we do something completely, fully, and we give ourselves to that situation with our best of intention and our best of capabilities, And the heart is very full. Now I want you to bring to mind a situation, a very ordinary situation, maybe in the family, maybe in a relation to another or to a group. Where for you, there wasn't any great effort applied in this situation. You were just part of this whatever it is that brought you some sense of well-being. but it had an edge of it that you weren't completely satisfied with. Something in the year that has stayed with you, nothing major, but it stayed with you because you perhaps feel it wasn't fulfilled, it wasn't completed. Yet in this situation, I, I want you to bring to mind what of that, what within that, you are still grateful for, you are still thankful for. Maybe it is the people who you've come to know and love. Maybe it was the outcome, although you weren't fully happy with it, you respected it. And you were grateful that there was a reasonable outcome. Gratitude may not be so in abundance. But as you look into that situation, There'll be many small details that taught you something. That took you away from just your own egoistical ideas about what should be. That made you work harder to relate or give. Gratitude doesn't always come from getting. It also comes from the capacity to give of ourselves when it's not always so easy to do so. Spontaneous gratitude comes when we don't always get what we want. But we see, ah, that was actually beneficial.
And the last little reflection. I want you to think of a very difficult relationship, situation, conversation. Maybe an action we did that we feel really was not wholesome. Or somebody else's action that we feel was not kind. Maybe it was something at our workplace that did not have any of the expectation and hopes we had for it or in the family. Maybe it was a disaster, an accident. some sort of suffering that lingered and still lingers. We can feel the heaviness in our body, the tightness, the, intention, the tension in our mind. As we reflect on this, we are still not resolved about it. And it comes back to us. In this situation, I'd like you to look for something that actually was really beneficial. Something we can be thankful for. Maybe it was a lesson. Maybe I became very clear about where I am in this relationship or this situation. Maybe I had learned to turn away and let it go. Or throw it away. As we reflect on what may have been a beneficial part of this, we can see that in everything we do, that doesn't have our own expectations or hopes, there is always something positive and beneficial and always something to be grateful for. Just for the last minute, just bring your mind back to that feeling of gratitude. It's not easy to always cultivate gratitude. We take many things for granted, especially the ones, the loved ones within our family. We expect things to be very predictable, outcomes to benefit us. So for a moment we can reflect that this too we are grateful for. I want you to now just relax your bodies, open your eyes and bring your legs up <laughs> if necessary. Yeah, just relax. <coughs> it's always very easy to bring up something that we have felt is extremely useful. 
things in our life that fulfill us with thanks and gratitude. But it's less easy to face that which is not so. Less easy to stay with what is very painful and still have gratitude for it. Still feel blessed that we're here breathing and are able to meditate and have equanimity for that which may be not so wholesome. Recently, I'm part of, as many of you know, a committee called the Australian Sangha Association. I've sat on all the positions, currently uh, the vice chair again. But recently we had an interesting, very lengthy discussion now, I don't know if any of you have been to the, the gallery, the NGV, recently. And the NGV has created an exhibit by a Chinese artist of a very magnificent Buddha in the Parinibbana position. The Buddha is gone in this position from this world and transcended into is in a state of Nibbana, complete equanimity and peace. It is an exquisite Buddha. It comes from one of the caves in China. And the artist was trying to create something that was about East and West philosophy. And on top of this Buddha and around it and hanging off it are these Greek mythological philosophers. Some are a little bit naked. <laughs> but this piece of art created so much of a, an, a trail of people, one or two actually, I think, making quite a lot of complaint and raising the bar of what is right and wrong about how we shall share the image of the Buddha. And I was thinking, wow, shouldn't we be grateful to get such a magnificent image of the Buddha? Yes, there's a few figures around it that we may wonder <laughs> why has he got a few naked figures hanging over him. But for many of those people coming to look at this piece of art, it may be the only time they really see a Buddha. And when you are faced with it, you are attracted to the Buddha. The other little figures, oh yes, there's so and so, Socrates, and you know, but they're so insignificant in comparison. So even if you're looking at it from a philosophical point of view, what is it saying? Nibbana is the greatest state we could ever aspire to. Even in that, I thought, wow, somebody's created such a piece of art to tell us that message. Thank you. But for some, it was not so. They, how dare they make recreate our Buddha with these naked figures hanging off it and put it in an art gallery? Well, at least it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> no, Jesus was worse. Jesus was standing a couple of years ago or a year ago in urine. How many... Christian iconography in the galleries around the world are absolute blasphemous. <laughs> or, or you cannot understand what they are about. The graphic is so shocking. You know, Jesus looks so terrible. But are some of the points we had to raise, are we 
to be so judgmental about art, even our own inner gallery. Now some years ago, two years ago I think it was, Aldi was selling Buddha beer. And a couple of us were raising, this is an issue. As I've raised in the past about Buddha on the base of Nike shoes, we all sent letters. Actually, it was hard. I said, let's make a petition, you know, get the BSV and, and the various associations to write. You know, this is maybe offensive being sold in such a public place like Aldi. Nobody actually really wanted to do it. So I called Aldi, I sent a message, had a long conversation. Said, you know, it only took a few people. So I said, if you don't want to sign a petition, call them, do something. But this time in the gallery, they wanted to get us all aboard to trump up to the gallery and demonstrate against it. And thank goodness the ASA sent a letter. And I'll read it to you. It, I mean, it's, it says a little more than I would have said, but at the same time, you know, uh, it was a reasonable point. The Australian Sangha Association was informed, hang on, that the National Gallery of Victoria will soon display a giant Chinese Buddha exhibit called the Eternity Buddha in Nibbana. It's a good name. We welcome the Buddha art, that the Buddha art is on display at the National Gallery and acknowledge the great effort in purchasing and installing the massive reclining Buddha art work, let alone the time of the work must have taken the Chinese artist, artist Zhu Zheng in creating it. We are aware that the arrangement, which was chosen by the artist, with some smaller figures on top of the reclining Buddha image, might offend some Buddhists and be regarded as culturally insensitive. The ASA is concerned about this reaction, the reaction it causes, as some boundaries might be pushed by art a bit too far. However, we do not support any protesting, but rather encourage tolerance. Many Buddhists and the general public will hopefully be awestruck rather than offended. They might even become curious to find out more about the sculpture, which is part of the installation and about the intentions of the artist as a result. The Buddha statue and the values it represents, forgiveness, peace, compassion, detachment, are certainly more ground and grounded and peaceful than any possible irritation or hurt. Furthermore, according to the NGV artist, he is hoping to bring about an understanding and appreciation across culture with his creation. We hope that the people who come to view the Eternity Buddha in Nibbana at the NGV will be uplifted and inspired by this giant artwork and by the deeper values which the gi gigantic Buddha image represents. I thought that was, you know, we all had a little say in it and we all made our suggestions and corrections. And we have to be also aware that Culturally, it may be insensitive. But sometimes there is in our life, and you would have noticed in your meditation, especially with the last one, when we look at a difficult situation, something that didn't have the outcomes we want, didn't invite our investing into what would have been better. I mean, especially with parents with children, there is always so many risks that children take and parents sit on the edge hoping it's going to be okay. doesn't matter how many warnings they share with the children or how much they try to educate and be a good parent to the children. Children don't have the capacity to understand risk until they're well in their 20s. 
and in workplaces, you know, so many people's input doesn't always have the outcome. And we have to be there and be part of the party when it fails. And this is an example of that. Where not everybody agrees. But as Buddhists, do we start to jump up and down? It can have actually quite strong negative repercussions. Every time the NGV wants to get a, a Buddha start, they're going to be less likely to get it. Or if they always have to meet with an executive Buddhist committee about what's right and wrong, you know, they didn't, they invited the Buddhists to come and talk about it. Nobody wanted to go because they wanted to go on their own terms which was to demonstrate against it. So it's very interesting, you know, sometimes when I tried to talk to a few people personally, and they were holding to their views. So it, I had to sit with that and accept and embrace their views as their views, as their opinions. And they're worthy to be listened to, they're worthy to reflect on. I don't necessarily share all of it, I share some of it. And in our life it is like this. We share some. We agree with some. I'm sure in all my talks there will be some there, I, I can see it on the faces, you know. <laughs> mm, the eyes roll back and look up at the roof or, you know, the head goes to one side or they look at you from the side, you know. Not Theravada enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not what the Buddha said. I sometimes wonder if I sound like, you know, you have all these things the Buddha said on the internet that the Buddha didn't say. <laughs> And sometimes when we are like this in life, you know, it is like when I'm with my Christian friends or my family, we have very different philosophical and emotional views about life. And if I hold them all so narrowly just from my tight Buddhist perspective, I won't have many friends <laughs> or relationships or good friends or good relationships. <laughs> People will feel very uncomfortable with me. In the last uh, week, I had a lovely opportunity to go and share um, a day out with my little grandniece. And this time, you know, she's all of three, so it's progressing from one, two, and three. We have <laughs> these outings. And it's wonderful to see how her observations are growing. But mind you, you take her, we took her to the NGV once and it was a great opportunity because there was a lot of playful things there that time. And again, at Federation Square, there was some really good kid stuff. But she runs, you know. We get into a room and she's already raced through to the other and then you f catch up and there she's looking at something. You know, she'd be looking at a toothbrush on a painting or looking at a face, a sculpted face, and absolutely fascinated. There was this sort of half dog, half dingo standing, some sort of Aboriginal art, a standing wolf of some sort. And here she is absolutely fascinated by it. And I'm watching her and th absorbed in this little tiny figure, this big, looking at this gigantic thing and embracing it. It was ugly. You know, of all the... She'd lost her dog just a week before. They had to put the Kimberly down because he became too ill. Or she, I think it is, became too ill. And, uh, and she came into a room where there were all these beautifully carved Aboriginal do dogs. 
and there was a little yellow one. Whatever she saw in the yellow one, except perhaps the colour of Kimberley, she went up, kneeled down, and she put her hands out. And I said, oh, does that remind you of Kimberley? And she looked up at me like this, you know. That tremendous capacity to, to be with it at three. And here we are, well, for me, 60 middles. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us unable to be with an artistic creation or an image of something that's within our culture actually quite beautiful. So she taught me something this day how to be with that, to go up to a little tiny yellow dog, lots of dogs, and to be with that pain she was feeling for her dog that she had lost and put her hands out like this. That's a, a sign of gratitude, reaching out, remembering, and being with, obviously, pain in her heart. disagreement, sadness. So when she looked up, I could see that. I mean, overwhelmed. I can't even imagine her little tiny mind trying to absorb. Federation Square at the moment has a floor which is rather strong representation of abstract, very male configurative art. And then another floor of very strong female figurative art. Very abstract, very colourful. And here she is looking at it. Mind you, in the, in the male, male one, it was all too strange. She took out the toothbrush, you know. <laughs> the little fingers pointing at everything. And she stays with it. Stays with it. And that is uh, something about staying with what it is we don't always feel we agree with or is something that is part of what I believe in. And staying with the difficulties of our children, the difficulties in our workplace, with gratitude that we are actually able to be there. Every environment is such a living environment. Our relationships are not something that we just put there and they're a, a living, interactive co-creation, really. We are growing together. Our thoughts, our emotions. Wow, how wonderful. If they were very static, like a picture or this, we, will get, we won't look at it after a while. I don't look at the microphone while I'm talking to you, you know. It's another object, useful as it is, and thank you. <laughs> You can hear because of it. <laughs> and in a way, I am interacting with it. But there's much of that in our life. Those very neutral things. That give life to what we are doing now. In the, usually in the Buddhist uh, stories of gratitude, of course you have, you know, the great story of the blind turtle who's swimming at the bottom of the sea. And they say every hundred years he rises to the surface to take a breath. And the chance of this turtle rising and putting his head through as he rises through some floating piece of, oops, 
floating piece of wood that's got a hole in it. It's very rare. So for the Buddha's teachings, gratitude is always about these very uh, big things in life. It is very rare to be reborn as a human, is the point. How rare it is to have this opportunity to meet the Dhamma. How rare is it for us to actually come together? Not so rare, but you know. It's your choice and my choice to be here today. So the rarity to share in any situation, what is very beneficial should not be taken lightly. What is important, what is caring and nurturing and kind, we must nourish that. Mm. And the the gratitude for our pain, our suffering, reminds me we had little work be, and thank you to those who came. <laughs> we didn't have many from the BSV, but some of the um, city Zen youth came. It was a terrible day, so I don't blame anyone for not coming. <laughs> Can you imagine we had these four absolutely horrendous days of rain? And it did say, showers lessening. So we, we left it to people because the city's end youth wanted to come regardless. And we said, well, if it's too wet outside, we'll meditate, you know, all day. So they came and we had some local people and some old students. All in all, we had 15. On this terrible day, they came up through an awful fog to get there by 9 o'clock, even from Frankston, <laughs> a long way away. And of all the work bees, it was a fabulous work bee. We had enough lightning, less lessening of showers in the morning to get quite a lot done. And people came with magnificently home-baked food, home-cooked food. So we had six bakes. We had a dozen other dishes that they'd prepared so lovingly and made the effort in this terrible weather, to make that conscious intention, I'm going anyway. Well, I was really touched. I thought about that for days. And we got lots, some really good jobs done. Even drains cleaned out that hadn't been done, gutter drains and box drains. And garden beds done and cleaned up. Many things, and painting. And then in the afternoon, after this wonderful meal, we meditate and have a Dharma talk. It's such a nourishing day. And you know, my, till the hall is done, the house is small, but everyone seemed to come and enjoy it. So I reflect here, you know, even though some situations are painful, it doesn't mean the outcome is going to be that way. We can project it's so oh, terrible, and you know, it's going to be a drag and just get wet and miserable and all the rest of it. We have these ideas about these outcomes, but actually the reality is it's often far from that. So it was a day of gratitude for all of us. And, um, you know, I think that... Uh, um, even though, you know, we make an effort and sometimes it just doesn't work. We have to know that effort in itself is a very worthy effort. That intention in itself is the path. In the Buddha's path, the intention itself is already fulfilling the path. So the intention to empty this vessel is already 
working on multiple levels without you even knowing it. The intention to understand the Dharma, even though we read the books, do the meditation, we can still snap at somebody and see they're wrong and I'm right. But if we have the intention and the gratitude, it will lessen. Of course, the gratitude to our parents, our teachers, our ancestors who have created this physical entity, have nourished our minds, and that's something we, we will carry with us this whole life, hopefully. Not that all our parents have been the most wonderful parents. The Buddha said, I tell you monks, there are two people who are not easy to repay. Which two? Your mother and your father. Even if you were to carry your mother on one shoulder and your father on the other for a hundred years, and you were to look after them by anointing, massaging, bathing and rubbing their old sore limbs. I added that. You will not in that way pay or repay your parents. If you were to establish your mother and father in absolute sovereignty over this great earth, abounding in the seven treasures, you would not find in that way you can pay or repay your parents. So even offering them all the gifts, all the treasures, we cannot repay. And why is that? Mother and father do so much for us to bring us, give birth and bring us up. They care for you, nourish you, and they introduce you to this world. If your parents were abusive, unkind and suffering, great hardships and poverty, still we can be grateful how they taught us not to be overcome by adversity. So the Buddha is saying here, even though we may not have a perfect idyllic upbringing, still to repay the debt for this human life is very difficult. And then it goes on to tell you how you can repay it through the practicing and understanding of the Dhamma on many levels. So your being here is bringing great benefit to infinite ancestors and great joy to your teachers. There are many quotes <clears throat> and I want to just finish today with a few whoops, did I lose it? With a few quotes about um, thankfulness and gratitude. If it's not good for all, our wishes to be fulfilled, though through sickness we recognize the values of health, through evil actions, the values of what is good, through hunger, the value of food, and through exertion, the value of rest. It's actually an old proverb, Chinese proverb. Elizabeth Kruber Ross says, to learn to get in touch with the silence within yourself and to know that everything in life has purpose. There are no mistakes, no coincidences. All events are blessings given to us to learn from. Einstein said, there are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is 
as though everything is a miracle. And Marshall Prowse said, let us be grateful to the people who make us happy. They are the charming gardeners who makes the soul, he's a gardener, makes us, our souls blossom. <laughs> when he's saying the gardeners, he's talking about the people who know how to grow something, whatever it is in life. Another proverb is, when eating bamboo sprouts, sprouts, remember the man who planted them. When eating, remember the many hands that bring this food to us. And if you cannot be content with what you have received, be thankful for what you have escaped. <laughs> Author unknown. <laughs> Take full account of the excellence which you possess and in gratitude remember how you would hanker after them if you had not had them. <laughs> so all the excellences we possess, I don't know if I'd hanker after them if I didn't have them, but maybe. And Doris Day says it simply, gratitude is riches. Complaint is poverty. Let us rise and be thankful. For if we didn't learn a lot today, at least learn a little. And if we didn't learn a little, at least we didn't get sick. And if we didn't get sick, at least we didn't die. So let us be thankful. The Buddha, the Buddha has said a very similar thing. This was put by an alley whistle. And reflect upon your present blessings, of which every man has plenty. Not on your past mis misfortunes, of which all men have some. We often, isn't it interesting how the mind regurgitates the wrongs, the lackings, the misfortunes. And how we miss so much of what is wonderful and right and valuable and kind right here <laughs> that was by Charles Dickens and William Ward says God gave you a gift of 84 uh, sorry 86,400 seconds a day have you used one to say thank you <laughs> And the last is both abundance and lack exist simultaneously in our lives as a parallel reality. It is always a conscious choice which secret garden we will tend. And when we choose not to focus on what is missing from our lives, we are grateful for the abundance that is present. The Buddhist practice of cultivating gratitude leads to the direct experience that connects us all and plays out our life in this moment of time. So hopefully we can take from this year of variations of gratitude we might say. <laughs> we can take from this year all the great effort and understanding and uh, enriching actions that we have um, that has connected us with other and we have also done honestly and openly because if we take this heart this memory this fulfillment from this year into the next, we start already off in a way that is going to bring us joy. We take what is beneficial from what has been difficult. Take what is kind from yours and others' actions. And carry this gratitude with you everywhere. 
remember it, work on it, develop it. Because it's a gratitude that will take you to Nibbana. It's not our understanding. It's not our intellect. It's not what we know. It's not what we've achieved. It's where our heart is so full of gratitude, so full of love, so full of kindness that touches others, whether we are Buddhist or not. So I wish you all a very happy festivity and a, a wonderful welcoming into the Western Solar New Year. <laughs> We're lucky we have two every year. And uh, may we have the good fortune for our paths to cross again in the coming year. So many blessings to you all. <laughs>